I uh, had prepared a really short and snappy um, introduction, and I will try to extend it a little bit. I'm sure that uh, Julia is nearby. Um, it's a pleasure for me to uh, introduce her uh, to you. Uh, Julia got her PhD at uh, Stanford in material science, and after a postdoc at Palo Alto, uh, joined the faculty of Caltech in 2007, where she has been ever since. Uh, she's interested in the unusual properties of materials at the nanoscale, where smaller is often different. Apart from studying these effects in natural materials, uh, her attention increasingly turned to using size effects in man-made metamaterials, uh, where you uh, design the microarchitecture to achieve unprecedented properties at the bulk scale. Or, in her own words, to create things that no one has seen before. Um, her work has been very influential for putting the whole uh, metamaterial field uh, on the map. Um, one of the, the very famous highlights that you may know is uh, the work on uh, ultralight uh, metallic micro lattices that she did in 2011, um, which are strong yet lighter than air, and I'm sure she's going to show them uh, in her talk. Uh, another favorite of mine is the work that she did uh, more recently on very beautiful hierarchically structured uh, nanomaterials. And, um, well, these are made of ceramic materials, but they nevertheless can withstand really large deformations before they break. Well, Julia won numerous awards, uh, such as the Society of Engineering Science Young Investigator Award uh, and the Kaffley Early Career Award. Um, She's also, in general, a very active person, and she's very active in promoting uh, science. Uh, for instance, she, in uh, 2016, she was selected by CNN as a 2020 visionary, uh, and you may have seen her on uh, Mythbusters. Um, on top of this, she uh, roller skates quite actively, and has been pursuing her second career as a concert pianist. And um, actually, after the talk, she will give uh, a, a concert, and I think she was prepping uh, for that, but I also think she is approaching uh, uh, the stage. So, uh, Julia, we are extremely pleased uh, that you have accepted our invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, Julia Greer. Thank you so much to all of you for being here, and a huge thanks to the organizers. Uh, especially to Renee. I don't know where she is, but she was amazing. She made, if anybody can be like Renee in terms of planning international travel, she's um, absolutely hands down. You guys should keep her as much as you can. And a huge thanks to Martin. I guess. <laughs> um, and uh, thanks again to, to all of you for being here. And uh, if you do like music, it, I, I hear there's going to be a musical performance afterwards uh, with the incredible cellist Aryan, whom I literally just met, and now we're playing together. So, <laughs> all right. So you've been staring at this title for some time now. So this is Materials by Design, and, and perhaps this first part makes a lot of sense, Materials by Design. And then you're staring at the second part, and it reads three-dimensional nano-architected metamaterials. And perhaps you understand what each individual word means by itself, but why they belong in the same sentence might be a little less clear. So my goal for the talk today is to convey to you why they do, in fact, all belong in the same sentence. So I imagine you're all familiar with a situation like this. You go to the store, you buy all these things that you absolutely need to buy. You, of course, you really, really need them. And um, the bags are just not quite strong enough to hold them all. So this is not the only example, from the wine glass that never makes it to the toast, to the balloons that pop all too easily, to the, oh yeah, I meant to have four children. So these are all examples of materials that are lightweight, and because they're lightweight, they're weak and easily damageable. Now, in contrast to that, materials that we know to trust, so of course some of us, especially uh, this one of us, is very familiar with the with uh, the airplane, of course it weighs nearly a million pounds. So it turns out that the tremendous expenditures in the airline industry come from having to propel a machine that weighs nearly a million pounds through the air. And just to give you an example, at five gallons per mile, at three dollars a gallon, my flight even to San Francisco, which for you would be like going to Germany, should cost me nearly five thousand dollars. And I don't want to know how much it would cost me to fly to Amsterdam at these expenditures. So. 
Uh, of course, the Dreamliner is already reducing their weight by half and so uses 20% less fuel. So this is an example of materials that are strong, but because they're strong, they're also heavy and expensive. Now, let's look at another example. These are specialized materials. Of course, of course these are solar panels. So what happens if this guy accidentally slips off the roof? Well, this is going to be bad news for everyone involved, right? This is single crystalline silicon. Of course, it's very brittle. So specialized materials also are heavy. Um, speaking of materials that are too heavy, remember how maybe a decade ago or so we were discussing this space elevator? Well, as far as I know, there still isn't one. And the reason why there isn't one and the reason for all these problems is because of this. This is a very busy plot, so let me walk you through this. What I'm plotting here is some kind of a mechanical attribute. I'm choosing to plot strength, but it can be stiffness, it can be toughness, it can be any mechanical attribute. It's a function of density. And the colorful domains that you see here are all the materials that we know how to make today. And so the picture that, that emerges right away is that we're very good at making materials that are simultaneously strong and heavy, or materials that are simultaneously lightweight and weak. And what we're very much not good at is making materials that are simultaneously lightweight and strong. Now, this is a log-log plot. And what that means is that even a modest increment within this space already represents a substantial change. So how do we get into this white space if everything that we already know how to make today is already plotted here? So the way we do it is by introducing the concept of architecture into material design. So when you look at this largest man-made stone monument, so this is the Great Pyramid of Giza, it stands about 150 meters tall, and it weighs nearly six million tons. Very, very heavy, right? And the weight at the base, of course, is measured in tons per meter squared because they're so, so massive. Now, in contrast to the Eiffel Tower, which, of course, it stands twice as tall. It's, engin it's an engineered structure, so it stands twice as tall, and it weighs three orders of magnitude less. And it's just as mechanically robust. So what that teaches us is that by carefully engineering your structure, you don't have to sacrifice any of the mechanical attributes, but you can use a lot less material. And so that's where we draw our inspiration. So we began this research by making these micro lattices in collaboration with HRL. So what I'm showing you here is a nickel micro lattice that's sitting on top of the world's most normal dandelion. This is, there's nothing photoshopped in here, and this is not the world's strongest dandelion. It's just a normal dandelion, and this micro lattice is made out entirely of nickel. In fact, it's so lightweight that if I were to hold one of them in one hand and a feather in the other, and to release them at the same time, the feather would fall down faster. The drag, the air drag on this very, very lightweight structure is tremendous. Now, that's an example of a material that's lightweight, but what we're after is the combination of lightweight and strength, and for that, you have to go down three more orders of magnitude in dimensions. And these are all examples of nano lattices that are fabricated in our group. So some of my graduate students made all of these samples. Just so you don't think that we're limited to periodicity, this is a nano TARDIS from Doctor Who. And that's about one thousandth of your hair diameter. It's very, very small. Now, most of these other structures are very much examples of cellular solids. And there's one level of porosity that's very obvious, right? Of course, they're all open cellular solids. And, and the slightly less obvious level of porosity is this. These are all interwoven three-dimensional networks of beams, tubes, hollow tubes. When you look at this zoomed-in image right here, what you see is that this tube is hollow, and its wall thickness is on the order of 10 nanometers. So this single material embodies every length scale from some nanometers to hundreds of nanometers to microns, hundreds of microns, and eventually millimeters and centimeters. And this is why it's appropriate to call it a metamaterial, because its properties can no longer be defined fully from the material's perspective or from structural perspective. At these nanometer length scales, everything is coupled together, as you will see. Now, just a few words on how we make these. These are all real. 
So we use this process called two-photon lithography. So this is what happens in a standard UV lithography, and I imagine that many of you have worked in a clean room uh, or done some kind of lithography. You can see this divergent cone, and so that's what limits your resolution to a particular dimension. Now, in two-photon lithography, the constructive interference of exactly two photons that are released in a femtosecond laser are focused in this very small voxel. Now, that voxel cross-links the polymer within a polymer resin in which it's rastered. So as it's rastered in three dimensions, it cross-links and hardens the polymer in those locations. So complexity comes for free in this process. I can write a nano version of each one of you, and it'll take me the same amount of time as writing a, a lattice. So here's the example. So I'm choosing to show you a periodic lattice here, but again, it doesn't have to be. Now, as we define the lattice, it's, made, it's all made entirely of cross-linked polymer. Well, we're not going to go and build the airplanes out of cross-linked polymers, right? So what we're ultimately interested in is a variety of deformation in a variety of material classes. So what we do after is we coat this scaffold with the material we're actually interested in. We, it can be a ceramic. So for example, we would use atomic layer deposition to deposit a ceramic or some kind of a metal oxide. We could use sputtering. We could use electro deposition. We could use, now that we are pretty well versed in additive manufacturing, we can utilize a variety of different custom-made resins to create exactly the structures that we want to obtain, in the end, a lattice which is made entirely of the material that we deposited because we etch out the sacrificial scaffold. So it looks a little bit like your Easter chocolate bunny, right? That's hollow on the inside. I'll tell you when we're ready for chocolate. So, uh, so that's the final structure, and that's the process, and this is what this process looks like in real time. So at first we align it exactly under this, in this instrument called, uh, made by a company, NanoScribe. Now you see that we're starting to pattern a particular lattice, this one is called, is called a, a tetrachidecahedron, and it's starting to resolve, to resolve exactly the lattice that we're trying to see, and then we're also able to write exactly what we're uh, writing so that we know, we know to refer to the sample. Now, I told you that at the nanoscale, everything behaves differently. So this is an example of the smaller is stronger size effect. If we were to plot strength as a function of size, again, on a log-log scale, of typical metals, think gold, think copper, think your common metals like nickel, aluminum, et cetera, in its single crystalline form. That doesn't mean that there are no defects, there are plenty of defects, but there are no grain boundaries. Now, all of these metals, these are experiments and computations, show this ubiquitous trend that shows smaller, stronger, in a power law fashion, because this is a log-log space. Now, Take exactly the same metal, metals and de deposit them in a different way. Deposit them using sputtering or deposit them using a different technique such that the microstructure is different. For example, such that it has grains. And all of a sudden, this trend is reversed. Now, smaller is weaker. This is a more modest size effect. It's not on a log-log scale. But nevertheless, this is something to be to be aware of because at these dimensions, at these nanoscale dimensions, you can now tune the strength by controlling the extrinsic dimensions of your material, metals at least, and its atomic level microstructure. But the size effect is actually even more powerful than that. For example, materials that are, met, that are supposed to be brittle, for example, this is a glass rod. This is a special kind of glass. This is a metallic glass. And we all know that glasses fail, of course, right? They brittlely fracture. Now, this is a 150 nanometer diameter glass rod that my former student is going to pull on. And what do we expect to happen when you pull on a glass rod or when you bend a glass rod or you deform a glass rod? It'll shatter. It'll fail via one of these catastrophic shear bands. So let's see what happens here. So we're especially look at this region right here. So this is a glass. Now, this is stress-strain data. And what you see right away is that it's deforming, it's deforming, it's forming a neck prior to failure. In fact, we deformed it in excess of 100%. Brittle materials are not supposed to do that. So these effects only emerge at the nanoscale. Here's the last example. So here's one of the ceramic nanolattices that we made. This is made of titanium, titanium nitride. And we're going to deform a single unit cell here. Now watch what happens as we're deforming it. These beams are deflecting. Imagine a hollow piece of chalk and trying to bend it. This would never happen, right? It would snap. And so what we're learning here is that these ceramic beams 
are not only deforming and deflecting, but they're doing it over many, many cycles. And when we calculate the stress, the Mises stress and then the tensile stress in this most strained part, it exceeds something like 1.7 GPA. No ceramic is supposed to stay intact when a tensile stress of 1.7 GPA is applied to it. So the takeaway message here is this. Sometimes materials get stronger. Sometimes they get weaker. Sometimes we can suppress brittle failure. But all of these effects emerge only at the nanoscale. And so the question is, can we somehow harness all of these beneficial size effects and proliferate them onto the larger scales? And this is where the 3D architectures come into play. So just a few words on how we perform these experiments. Of course, nano lattices are very hard to see with your eye or even in the optical microscope sometimes. So this is a special instrument that we use. It's called Cementor because it's part SEM, part nano indenter. So this part is just the SEM chamber, and here's the nanomechanical module. We also have all sorts of whistles and bells here. Here's a cryogenic module. We also can do electrical measurements in this instrument. And then these are the different inquisition devices. So what you can see is uh, we can pull on things, on things that are as small as 100 nanometers. We can compress things on things that are as large as many hundreds of microns and uh, bend and deflect. And so we torture our samples. Who, could, who would have thought that I could build a career on breaking things? But that's basically what we do. So here's an example. This is an octet nano lattice made out entirely of alumina. So in the ALD community, there's a joke. They always say, oh yeah, we can deposit anything you want as long as it's alumina. So this is alumina. It's hollow. The wall thickness here is 50 nanometers. That's very small, right? 50 nanometers. It's very, very porous. So think of your coffee mug with a severe case of osteoporosis. Now, a giant is going to come and step on it. And of course, we know it's very, very brittle, right? So, what, so it's going to crush and die. I mean, that, we wouldn't expect anything different. So let's see if that's what happens. So we're compressing it in our instrument. We're collecting data. And bam, sure enough, it crushes and dies. And you can see. Uh, this guy is completely dead. We have a little nano cemetery in our instrument. He doesn't even try. So, okay, so we'll look at this and we say, uh, why did we do this experiment? Well, so there's one good thing, and that is when you look at the stress strain data, the strength exceeds 25 MPA. Something that's 99% air shouldn't have anything measured in mega units. It could be pascals, kilopascals, but megapascals, that's, that's pretty good. So the strength is still there. So what we did is we repeated this experiment. Everything is the same. Same microstructure, same dimensions, same instruments, same deposition techniques, same everything. The only thing that's different is the wall thickness. We have now reduced the wall thickness by a factor of five. It's now 10 nanometers, so even more so, even more osteoporosis. And so we would expect it to crush and die even more. And as we start to compress it, this is very, very brittle ceramic. As we're starting to compress it, we're expecting it to snap at any moment now. And you can see it compressing. And at any moment now, we're ready for it to crush. And, and it recovers fully. So my former student, Lucas, just made a ceramic sponge that recovers after compression. So if this doesn't convince you that there is, in fact, a size effect, I should just fly home right now. Forget the concert. So this, the only difference is the, is the wall thickness, right? All right, so thinking outside the box now, of course, your density across these structures doesn't have to be uniform. So this effect can now be utilized in engineers. So this is one example where we did half and half, half low density, half high density. And you can very clearly see this being reflected in the deformation. So you can see that the, they're deforming very much sequentially. You can attain different stresses, different strains, and then um, and then work with this kind of a material. And then this guy is just like a wounded soldier, so he's still really, really trying to stand up and, and eventually succeeds, in fact, I hear. Um, all right, so wouldn't you like to find out why this happened? I mean, it's kind of remarkable that it recovers, right? It, it really shouldn't. Materials should not be doing this. Ceramics should not be doing this. Well, turns out the answer lies in mechanics. So we all know about beam buckling. I think Eric van der Giesen is here, so you can ask him questions about this. Uh, so beams can buckle via Euler buckling. And in fact, I think I taught about this yesterday. Um, now, if we have a polymer beam that's encapsulated in a rigid ceramic, we would expect ceramic wall structure. But that's actually not what we have. We have hollow ceramic beams. And one way that these beams buckle is by the shell. This process called shell buckling. It's an elastic process. Now, 
it turns out that we can set this energetic balance such that, such that we set the failure criterion so that the failure strength is equal to the local buckling stress. And it turns out that if we were to have a beam of radius A and thickness T, there's this critical ratio of T over A, which dictates that for this particular material, if it's higher than, the, than, than this critical ratio, then the material will fracture. But if it's lower than the critical ratio, then the material will buckle and then it'll be able to recover. So let's see if this works. Well, okay, so for the 10 nanometer wall thickness, which you saw recover, this ratio is below the critical ratio and sure enough it recovers. This is the image of the sample after the deformation and you would never know because it looks exactly the same. You can see these are different unit cell sizes and so they all recover back to their original shape. Now, as we increase the wall thickness, you can see and deviate further and further from this critical ratio, you can see that the deformation becomes much more catastrophic, much more stochastic and much more irrecoverable. So, turns out the answer lies in mechanics. Right? Okay, so uh, let's explore. Let's um, let's explore this further. So, uh, does it work all the time? Well, we decided to venture into the world of fractals. So, we now made these fractal nano lattices, such that each individual beam is now comprised of its own uh, self-similar unit cells. And so, you can see it's just like a crane uh, being reinforced like this. And so. You can see, let's see what happens here. So now these uh, take a very long time to write. So this is a half of such unit cell. Again, very, very brittle ceramic. You can see what's happening. First, of course, we're compressing the pointy top. And then watch this. There's a lot of kinking happening. So we're expecting these beams to snap at any moment now. This, again, a very, very brittle ceramic. Kind of hurts me every time I watch this video. And it fully stands back up. So fully recoverable no matter how complex the stress state is. Now, if it's all about mechanics, that means that if we were to build a building whose wall thickness is 10 centimeters and whose beam diameter is three meters and the whole thing is two kilometers by two kilometers by two kilometers and I'm sure in Singapore somewhere there's a building like that and a giant comes and steps on it, it'll snap right back, right? Please tell me that you're laughing because this would never happen and those of you who think that this will happen, please come and take my class. Uh, yeah, very funny. That would, this is like 50,000 of our instruments <laughs> would fit into this. So this would never happen, right? But why? Mechanics is scale free. If it's all about the ratio, as long as we preserve the ratio, the building should snap right back. But of course it would never happen. Why not? How does the size effect manifest itself here? This is not a rhetorical question, so if somebody wants to shout out one word, will be the answer to it all. Nobody's willing to. Uh... Okay, I heard a lot of words, but I'm not sure if I heard the right one. Now, we know that brittle failure in, or failure in brittle materials occurs at flaws. The probability of finding a flaw, millions, hundreds of millions of flaws in something that's this large is 100%. And there's a distribution of their strengths. So when we first start compressing this material, this building rather, the local stresses within this building will necessarily exceed some flaw and then the material will start crumpling at those flaws. So before it ever has a chance to buckle, it will necessarily break at those flaws. In contrast to something that's only 10 nanometers thick, first of all, the size of the largest flaw is only 10 nanometers, so that's not a weak flaw by any stretch of imagination. And the probability of finding a flaw is much, much lower. So the way the size effect manifests itself here is by our ability to make much more perfect materials that are nanometer thick. If we were to make a thin film that's 10 nanometers thick and fill up this whole room so that in volume it's the same as bulk material, it'll be much more perfect, much more close to being ideal than something that's written like a brick. So that's, that's the, the, the right answer was no. Um, okay, now the original question was, did we hit the white space? and how close did we get to the theoretical prediction? So just to remind you, this, was the, this is the simplified domain uh, space here. There's the maximum, and this is where we are. So these are the points, uh, these are the points that you just saw of the hollow nano lattices. These are the hierarchical nano lattices. And what you see right away is this by going 
uh, to hierarchical structures, we gain, or rather lose, two orders of magnitude in relative density, and we fix the scaling for from worse than perfect to much close, more, more close the, um, to linear, which is what we would expect for that to be. We're not quite close to theoretical maximum in these structures, but this research was done so four years ago, five years ago now. So we can do much better, and maybe some of you can do much better now. So what this shows us is that this pathway, this methodology of combining the useful size effects in three-dimensional architectures certainly lends itself as a way to make entirely new materials and new classes of materials that can land us in the white space. And so this would be a good time for me to take a dramatic pause and to invite you to choose only one of these areas. I think I'm supposed to only speak for 45 minutes. So I can't tell you about everything that my group does. We have a pretty large group and everybody is doing really neat stuff. So I managed to categorize them into three different categories and we're gonna vote. And Renee is gonna help me count the votes, please, <laughs> wherever you are. So I can tell you a little bit more, a lot more, about mechanics. I can tell you about fracture. I, can, I haven't told you anything about fracture. Everything we've deformed so far has been in compression. So I can tell you about tensile fracture of these nanoarchitected materials, about real biological materials like diatoms and bone. Or I can tell you about electrochemistry. I can tell you about batteries, 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 and how mechanics plays a role in that. Or this is probably the most exciting and the most new direction that we've been doing. <laughs> I can tell you about additive manufacturing and material synthesis because what that allows us to do is to synthesize entirely new material systems. So uh, please look at this for a little bit. Um, also, can somebody tell me how much more time I have? Like 20 minutes or 15 minutes? Five minutes. <laughs> who, is the, who is the boss here? <laughs> All right, the, I, I, I hear the boss is sitting here. How much time do I have? 20 minutes, fantastic. You can choose any of these areas. <laughs> so, uh, okay, who would like to hear more mechanics? Just raise your hands. Okay, all right. Who would like to hear about batteries? All right, a lot more actually. And who would like to hear about additive manufacturing? <laughs> all right. I think, um, I think that the, the public has spoken, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about additive manufacturing. <laughs> Thank you, that was pretty unambiguous. <laughs> I'm actually surprised, for, for a bunch of physicists, nobody wants to hear about mechanics? Fine. Um, all right. So this is, uh, this is where um, I have to tell you. So I work at Caltech. And at Caltech, you can really only major in physics. It can be physics with a material science flavor. It can be physics with electrical engineering flavor, physics with a chemistry flavor, which is what you're about to see. But it's really all physics. And um, there's some brilliant graduate students at Caltech. So one of them has figured out, was actually, he's a very frugal guy. And he said, you know, we're spending a lot of money on these resists. So the way Nanoscribe works, it's a fantastic company. But it's a little bit like the razor blade manufacturers. You can buy the razor. Uh, actual shaving device for relatively cheap. It's the blades that then they get you with. So in the same way, that's how Nanoscribe gets you with their resist because you have to buy the resist from them unless you have these very smart physicists and chemists from Caltech. So what they said is, look, we don't want to be slaves to these resists and we want to be able to manufacture different materials. So we started this work a couple years ago where my students showed that you can functionalize these resists at the monomer phase such that you can add different functionalities to it. For example, you can use this process that's called thiol-Michael addition to add different functionalities here. So this is a fluorinated uh, uh, carbohydrate, carbo carbohydrate. This is a very long chain uh, Teflon-like polymer chain. This is an aromatic fluorinated fl uh, uh, aromatic compound. We can attach alcohols and phenols, and this is a very, very, um, important reagent. This is called NBOC. So this is a protector, deprotector. So if you want to have a structure that's very much inert upon some environments, but then it becomes very reactive upon some other environments and then attaches itself chemically to some, or binds chemically to another compound, this could be very useful. For example, uh, you can attach DNA 
to it. And so what you see here are the images that fluoresce because they've been functionalized and because they are now bound to DNA. This is another image that shows you something else that's bound to the DNA. Imagine, actually hopefully you don't have to imagine this, but uh, for cancer patients who have chemotherapy, therapy, you can, uh, the chemotherapy itself can be very, very effective, but then it's very toxic, it, it kills the, the, the tumor cells, but then it's quite toxic to the rest of the body. And so wouldn't it be great if we could wick away the excess medication after it cured the, the tumor? And so what this shows you is a membrane which allows the blood cells to flow through. But now this membrane that we wrote directly by using this process is functionalized with DNA, and DNA binds to the chemotherapy drug selectively. So what you see fluorescing here is doxorubicin. So doxorubicin is a, is a chemotherapy drug that's used for liver cancer. And so now after it treated the, the tumor for about 30 minutes, it's now bound to our, our membrane and now we can just wick it away in an umbrella-like fashion. So this is an example where chemical functionality buys you a lot in terms of um, being selective, uh, selectively binding to uh, various agents. Now, that served as an inspiration to explore further for how we can make these resists. For example, additive manufacturing of metals. We had discovered that additive manufacturing of metals is actually quite limited in terms of their dimensions. We can do pretty well down to 50, 50 microns. I'm being pretty generous here. 50 microns we can do, but below 50 microns, maybe not so much. So my student, Andre, has figured out that if you use this kind of a precursor, it's called a MOF a metal organic framework. What you see here is that there's a nickel ion that's sequestered inside of an organic uh, uh, shell. So if you use this kind of a moth and then re react it with an acrylic chain, you can do a ligand exchange reaction and that will allow you to have, to have a cross-linkable resin which now contains nickel. Now, if you add this kind of a nickel containing resin with a photo initiator together with a cross linker. What you can do is envision a process where we can write directly in that resin. And so this is the CAD model, of course, of what it would look like. Here's the real image as we're writing it in the nanoscribe. We didn't know if this was going to work. If we created a resin like that, it just all looks like a clear viscous liquid. But now what we're discovering is that sure enough, it is writable. Well, okay, so my student Andre created this resin so now, look at the dimensions here. So this is 10 microns, so it's still quite big. And the beam size here is about one micron or so. And this is an organic containing, rather a nickel containing organic framework. But what we really want is just the nickel. How do we get rid of the organics? We burn them. So the fancy word for that is called pyrolysis. So pyrolysis, of course, is burning without the oxygen. And so this is burning an argon and, and possibly forming gas. And what it enables us to do is to volatilize all the carbon-containing compounds. And then what we're left with is a structure that's a direct replica of what we wrote. But it's now 90% smaller volumetrically because every linear dimension shrinks by about 40% when you burn off the organics. And so watch this. Our unit cell size went from 10 microns to 2 microns, and the beam size here is 400 nanometers. So my student Andre just made an entirely additively manufactured nickel something, nickel structure, whose critical dimensions are well below a micron, which hadn't been attained before. Now, of course, the question is, well, how nickel is this nickel? You burn things, but... How much do we trust this? Well, so the EDS analysis shows us that it is, in fact, predominantly nickel. You can see that nickel is, content is about 92 atomic percent. There's some carbon, some oxygen. So when we did the transmission electron microscopy on these samples, and I just have to tell you, those of you who don't do microscopy, this is very, very hard to do because you have to put things on a special TM grid. And how exactly do you pick up a feature that's 400 nanometers and put it on the TM grid? So my clever student, Andre, wrote the grid over the TM grid and just hoped that one of the beams would just happen to subtend a hole. And sure enough, it did. So this particular beam was created in exactly the same process that I just described, but there was no gallium or any cleaning or any other agent used. So this is as unadulterated and as clean a sample as you can get. And sure enough, here's the high-resolution TM image. 
we see predominantly nickel, there's the diffraction pattern of nickel. We see a little bit of nickel carbide and a little bit of nickel oxide as expected. There's a little bit of surface uh, um, oxide. So, and the mean grain size here is on the order of 20 nanometers. Now, we made this, of course, what we're ultimately interested in is its strength. Well, is this, it's nanoporous which is usually bad news for mechanical properties. And it's also nanocrystalline, which is usually good news for the mechanical properties. So let's see how this guy does. So as we're compressing it, it looks very much like you, what you would expect for a cellular material. You see this layer by layer collapse. You can see that the stresses here are, are on the order of megapascals. So this is very good, actually. So let's see how this compares to others. Um, so, so these are the different snapshots of that movie that I'm playing right here, and these are different samples to show you that it's quite repeatable. Now, let's see. If this is specific strength, now specific strength is strength normalized by density, right? So this is a way to compare across different metals. And this is beam size. What you can see is that this is all the ex existing additive manufacturing processes to date. And you can see how rapidly the strength drops with the beam size reduction. So as we go from, so this is a thousand microns, this is one millimeter, right? As we go from one millimeter to a hundred microns, we drop two orders of magnitude in strength. That's how poor the additive manufacturing processes that exist today are able to control things or control the quality of the material at the small scales. And for them, small is a hundred microns. For us, a hundred microns is huge, right? So, and now compared to our work, so we had to put a huge break in the scale here because we're, so we're at the beam dimensions of, so this would be one micron, right? So we're at 500 nanometers, a little below 500 nanometers. So we're, we're two orders, three orders of magnitude below the smallest that has been reported and our strengths are comparable to something that has the dimensions of roughly uh, 500 microns or so. So if we were to extend this lane, extrapolate this line, just for the sake of the argument, we would end up at something like 10 to the minus three, and ours are uh, at the uh, maybe four, four orders of magnitude uh, higher than that. So what that shows you is that creating your own custom resins, not only does it enable you to create materials that were never possible before, metals, for example, think tungsten. Tungsten is extremely hard to form. So we can now create tungsten using this process, but its mechanic, their mechanical properties are superior to those that would be available using conventional additive manufacturing techniques. So that's nanoscale uh, at work. Now, we didn't stop at this, and we decided that beyond metals, there are many more exciting materials, many more exotic materials. For example, titania. So titania, titanium dioxide, has photocatalytic process, uh, properties. What that means is that when it's exposed to sunlight, it, create, it creates reactive oxygen species, which are then able to kill microorganisms. So you can imagine water purification or something, uh, a device that can serve as such. Now, can we make complex oxides? Well, sure enough, sure enough we can, because we can use titanium etoxide as a precursor, then put it through, exact turn the crank, put it through the same uh, ligand exchange process, and sure enough, not only are we able to write this, so here's the, the, res the titania containing resin, this is what it looks like after pyrolysis, it's actually this very pretty purple color. But what Andre showed is that these tiny structures are certainly, they're pretty, but they're not very good for water purification. So he showed that you can even 3D print these. These are much, this is going larger. So you can see the scale bar here, so this is five millimeters. So this is like a centimeter or more than a centimeter. So you can hold them in your hand. Now imagine when you put these into your water bottle and it just, you, you, with very contaminated water, like with E. coli, something that would kill you. And then you place this water bottle under sunlight, it deactivates these agents. And so here's a demonstration of that. This is methylene blue, so it's E. coli type, uh, an E. coli type of a bacteria. Uh, and both, all three of these petri dishes contain that, and all three of these petri dishes now contain our micro lattices. I'm not sure if you can see these titanium ones. And you can see the color is uh, fully, fully absorbed, and so they're no longer containing these blue, methylene blue uh, agents. So this is very much promising. I'm not suggesting this is the best way to purify water, but it works. And so this is a phenomenon that's demonstrated uh, using this process. Now, a, an entirely different approach is using hydrogel. So everything up to this point has been not water soluble, which is not necessarily ideal for 
creating these. Now, if you want to work with water is great, water is cheap, water is abundant. So it turns out that you can also create very exotic materials like zinc oxide, which has piezoelectric properties using a hydrogel synthesis method. So this is zinc containing aqueous photoresin. Resin. This is a very different approach. Turns out you can also, now this process of course is not called pyrolysis anymore because there's plenty of oxygen, but upon a certain thermal treatment, we can get zinc oxide and now this zinc oxide is nanocrystalline. Piezoelectricity is usually manifested only by single crystalline zinc oxide, so we were a little bit worried about this. Now, doing the measurements, turns out we didn't have much to worry about. We were very satisfied to see that this is a zinc oxide containing resin. This is not zinc oxide. And you can see this is our voltage response and this is our loading response. So piezoelectric materials respond by either producing a current or by a bias generating a bias in response, in, in response to mechanical perturbation and vice versa. Now here, look, we're mechanically perturbing it and nothing happens here. When we burn off the organics and convert this entire thing, the entire nano lattice into zinc oxide, sure enough, upon mechanical perturbation, our voltage significantly drops. So it's very much, at least there's very clear electrical mechanical coupling in these materials, so they really work. Um, and I'd like to finish by telling you the story of carbon. Up to this point, I've been telling you that we've been burning off carbon like it was bad news, right? But actually, carbon itself is great in terms of stiffness and lightweight. It's already a lightweight material, so now if we make it very, very porous and make these structures intentionally out of carbon, maybe there's something there. So these, this is our collaboration with a group at Tsinghua University, and you can see we made glassy carbon nanolattices, two different architectures. We were trying to look at the effect of optimizing the geometry. So this is an octet uh, cellular solid, very much stretching dominated, very stiff and rigid structure. And this is the so-called isotrust structure, which is supposed to be optimized. Some theory physicists, some people like you, have told us that this is supposed to be optimal. <clears throat> Thank you for that. So what we're observing is that doesn't matter. Carbon is brittle, no matter what you do to it. And so this was a very humbling lesson in showing that architecting doesn't always lead to better properties. And sometimes the defects is what kills you. So defects are something that's very, very important to worry about and to think about. And just keep that because I would like, keep that, you'll understand why. So what we're learning is that these carbon uh, micro and nano lattices are actually very strong. So this is 1.2 GPA. We haven't, been, we haven't been to the GPAs yet with the architected materials, so they're very, very strong, but they're also very, very brittle. So, very, so it, it's uh, what, you, what you like. If what you're after is the stiffness and the lightweight, but susceptibility to flaws, then this is the right material to you, for you. But here's an important lesson. Like I said, this was a very humbling uh, learning experience because we learned that nothing, that, that you don't gain anything, except you wouldn't know it, because if you look at the individual beams, individual carbon beams, it's always very important to understand what your nano, what your basic building blocks are doing. Look at this carbon, purely carbon, glassy carbon nanopillar. Uh, I think this one, it's a micropillar, it's 1.5 microns diameter. Look at what carbon is doing. We all know graphite, right? We all have written with pencils before. It's supposed to shatter, but if this guy thinks that it's rubber. This carbon is compressing to a tremendous amount of strength. 35% compressive strain out of carbon. That has not been shown before. So even though each individual building block becomes deformable at the nanoscale, when you construct a lattice out of it, it doesn't work. And so this is some TM uh, images to show you the microstructure is in fact glassy carbon because this is where people may ask, well, what kind of carbon is it? Is it SP2 hybridized, SP3 hybridized? Is it graphitic? It's not graphitic, but it has some content of the curled graphene fragments. So these are real uh, TM images that show you this. It's very much amorphous, very much glassy. Um, and so that microstructure enabled us to model it and to perform molecular dynamic simulations to reveal the mechanism. Why does carbon think that it's rubber? What, uh, who does he think he is? So this, the, uh, these atomistic simulations are very helpful in revealing the deformation processes because there's a very clear transition from brittle. So these are diameters at which the carbon is brittle, and then these are the diameters which, where this carbon becomes ductile. So it occurs somewhere below four microns, so it's actually some, something like two microns of a, uh, that shows this transition. And it turns out that there are these hot spots, and in fact it's those graphene, uh, curled graphene fragments that allow for shear, localized shear processes to accommodate 
that amount of global compression without brittle failure. And so that's what the simulations reveal, uh, both in tension and in compression. So we did some tensile. You didn't want to hear about the tensile mechanics, but we do actually quite, quite a, a few students in my group do tensile experiments and fracture experiments. And what you can see that, that both in compression and tension, uh, it makes sense that you would undergo this brittle to ductile transition. Now, as we were learning about carbon, we discovered that we've hit yet another white space. And when we look at the strength as a function of density in now more populated space right here, we see that we are much closer to the theoretical strength than we were able to get to with the other materials. And so what that teaches us is that even though the carbon nanolattices are susceptible to flaws, they actually are the only ones that attain close to theoretical limit and land us very prominently in the white space. So we still have work to do, but this is all very promising, and at least we seem to be on the right uh, path here. Now, I'd like to finish by showing you this video. Remember what I said about the defects? Well, it turns out when, um, when you have a defect, which many of us think of as a flaw, you take lemons and you turn them into lemonade. So what you can do is make the defects work for you. In fact, what I'm about to show you is a battery. Okay? This is a top view of a battery. It's tetragonal. So, so it's a three-dimensional structure, and we're looking at it from the top. It's tetragonal, so just imagine rectangles all step, stacked on top of one another. What my student Xiaoxing is going to do is he's going to lithiate it. So it's an anode. So we're going to lith lithiate, and then the lithium is going to go into the silicon. These beams are made out of silicon. And as he lithiates it, just watch what happens. So he's lithiating. You can see the beams are all buckling buckling, buckling into a particular pattern. And that pattern very much resembles the pattern that you see here. Of course, it's the Caltech logo. So what we discovered is that when you can understand your defects, you can actually engineer with them and plant it in such a way that they're not visible. You can't see them. You don't know about them, but you can program you can program your structure such that they morph into a particular shape and respond to external stimuli in a very predictable and controllable and programmable way. And uh, just a few words on scalability. Usually the question that I get after showing this talk is, wow, these materials are really interesting, but uh, what good are they if they're only in these itty bitty, smaller than, your, smaller than uh, the thickness of a sheet of paper uh, form factors? Well, we are really working on scaling them up. And so actually this is no longer last year, this is now two, three years ago. It took us 12 hours to write something that's 100 by 100 by 100 microns. Now we can do much better. Actually this is so last year also. So in about six hours we can write something that's half a millimeter by half a millimeter. And for scalability, this two photon lithography is not really gonna work. The nanoscribe folks are very creative in speeding up their process, but it's not really manufacturable. And so for something to be able to print these in sheet type form factors, we need to rely, we need to invent a different technology. And so this is what we're working on. In fact, we just recently started a company that's doing this. And so we're using interference lithography together with the metasurface masks, such that in a single laser pulse, instead of a voxel being resolved, we create the entire nanolattice field and then we can step through the resist in a conventional lithography type fashion to create a sheet of paper in the, or a sheet of nanolattices rather uh, that's in the same amount of time as it would take the nanoscribe or as, as it would take a two photon lithography process to write a much smaller sample. So that's where we're headed with scalability and um, they're promising results already. Now, <sighs> let's take us a breath, and if you walk out of this room, scratching your head, thinking, okay, she showed us all these images, she told us some, a whole bunch of stuff, it was just too much. I'd like you to leave with the following message. If you are clever about three parameters, one of them is the atomic level microstructure of your material. It's very important that you really understand your grain structure, your amorphous, anything, what kind of atomic arrangements are your material. Are. That's one. The second one is the specific size effect that your material responds to. Maybe your material will get stronger when you reduce its dimensions. Maybe your material will become ductile. Whatever your material does, you have to understand what, how it responds to the size effect. And then the third parameter is the specific architecture that you design. Is it a cellular solid? Is it beam-based? Is it surface-based? What is it? 
And now if you're clever about these three parameters, you can create entirely new classes of materials. In fact, not only new classes of materials, but materials with not only unprecedented properties, but unprecedentedly uncoupled properties, in the sense that properties that have always been coupled together, like density or weight with just about everything, thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity, etc., you no longer have to be slaves to that. And the reason why you would want to do that is so that our kids grow up in the world where no, there are no more hearing aids, because we'll just be able to write the cochlea bone for you directly on the scaffold and put it directly in your ear. You won't need the hearing aids anymore. So that your iPhone 83 holds its charge for months at a time without needing to be recharged because the problems are all in the battery. Of course, helium is a very uh, useful resource and, and, and it's being depleted and so the balloons will no longer have to be filled up with helium because vacuum is lighter than air. So if we could just evacuate all the air and as soon as we figure out how to make our nano lattices not porous, they'll be stiff enough to be able to make balloons out of them. Uh, the Christmas ornaments, of course, will never shatter anymore. It's a very relevant example right now. And here's our current most exciting pursuit. Uh, we all just had tremendous desserts. So this is, this is an example of chocolate, something that we very much like. So what we're working on now is chocolate nano lattices, which are 100% taste, 99.9% .9 air, and 0.01% calories. And so with that... So, so I just wanted to say, this is my group. You can see we're working very hard on the beach in Malibu um, and all the funding sources that enable this work. I have to show this. And a huge thanks to all of you. So. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to Julia.